you those secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our heart by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, ending Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. They shall run and not be weary. They shall 
walk and not faint. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm for today is Psalm 147. Let us say it responsibly by half the verse. Hallelujah! How good it is to pray, sing praises to our God. How pleasant it is to honor him with praise. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem. Yes. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted. And binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars. And he calls them by their name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. There is no limit to his wisdom. The Lord lifts up the lowly. Cast the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God upon the harp. He covers the heavens with clouds. And he prepares the earth. He makes grass to grow upon the mountains. And green plants to serve mankind. He provides food for flocks and herds. And for the young ravens when they cry. He is not impressed by the might of a horse. He has no pleasure in the strength of a man. But the Lord has pleasure in those who fear him, and those who await his gracious favor. Hallelujah. reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel, for I, for if I do this in my own will, I have a reward. If not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am, uh, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks.
she began to serve. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions wanted to pray. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that it is what I came out to do. And he went through Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues, and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts always be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. It was many, many years ago when I was director of Christian Ed and Sunday School that whenever one of the teachers would get questions, especially those pesky theological ones that they couldn't understand or didn't want to deal with, they'd come and get me on Sunday morning. And I would see them standing in the back of the narthex, waving at me in a panic. And I'd slowly move away from the altar using the Benedictine walk and head to the back hoping that it was something, well, not medical. And one Sunday I saw the teachers with the eight, nine-year-olds frantically waving at me, so I huddled off to the back. And the problem, it seemed, was that the youngsters were in a highly spirited debate over Noah's Ark. What animals could possibly be in the Ark? How they got there? And in particular, they wanted to know how it was possible for certain animals, such as a kangaroo, to get to the ark from Australia. They wanted to know how did they cross the ocean from Australia and get to Israel and the ark and how long it took. And of course, none of the teachers wanted to touch this one. And after listening to the children's spirited arguments, I simply asked them, how do you think that God got the kangaroo to the ark? One obviously precocious child said, FedEx. <laughs> now, <clears throat> this seemed an acceptable answer to everyone. FedEx, they could understand. And so then they all went back to coloring their little pieces of paper and building a stick arc. You know, those popsicle stick things? We used to do those back then. Now, unless you think that this was the wisdom of Solomon on my part, it was not. You see, I used to dread certain lessons in Bible studies, in Bible stories, because in those days we used the lectionary-based Sunday school curriculum. And I would see these lessons coming up, and I would think, well, I better be prepared. Because very often young people have fascinating questions about Scripture. And in particular, they find things like demons, exorcisms, and unclean spirits, and how does a kangaroo get to the ark, as very pertinent Sunday school questions. And so I used to try and prepare for these things in advance so that I would not be totally shocked. And so from last week and this week's lessons, they kind of reminded me of those days 
because I know that if I were doing that Sunday school again, I would get those panicked wavings from the Sunday school teachers going, could you please explain demons and unclean spirits to them and what, they're, what they are? Because we don't want to do so. And so I thought, aha, uh -huh, I get it. I do get it. Last week, Jesus was exorcising unclean spirits, and uh, that's the term which gets translated as demons. And as he does those casting out of demons, they are speaking to him. And the lessons there are, are a distraction, those, those demons and those exorcisms. There are little distractions, let alone join with how the kangaroos get to Israel. They are a distraction from the point of what the Gospels are trying to teach us. And, and I thought, because I think the reason that I got assigned Sunday school was I would be with them. You see, I found it fascinating that these spirits would call out to him, to Jesus, and speak. And, of course, this week he tells them to be quiet, which I think is a good idea. But what amazed me last week, and what amazes me this week, is that here are demons coming out of people and speaking to the crowds, and obviously they heard them, and the response from the crowd is, wow, by what authority does he do these things? See, uh, that wouldn't have been my response. My response would have been, where did the demons go when he cast them out? And I would probably be going in the opposite direction. The fact that they weren't even amazed by demons. Totally flabbergasted. Because I would bet that in today's world, if that happened, we wouldn't just say, wow, we're amazed by the authority with, by which he does these things. So, the casting out of demons is not something that we do in our modern world. And very often, many of the things that, uh, and the stories that we read and hear about in, in scripture, uh, don't make a lot of sense to us. And that's because some of these things, like, like demons, um, are not part of what we consider everyday life. Unless, of course, you're watching The Walking Dead. I had my grandson ask me uh, the question, goes, uh, are demons like The Walking Dead? And I went, that's a theology beyond me, sweetheart. Uh, but probably not. And as I said, sometimes we get so caught up on these little things, these little pieces around the story, that we miss the essential lesson. Because we are looking at scripture from a viewpoint of modernity, and not necessarily how it was put together 2,000 to 3,000 years ago. And so we don't understand that the Bible is old. It was written and put together in antiquity. And most of all, because we don't understand what the Bible is. The Bible takes its name from the Latin word Biblia. And for those of you who have taken any of the romance lessons, Biblioteca. Uh, and from the Greek, the uh, Biblia, the books. And so when we talk about the Bible, we have a tendency in our time to see the Bible as one book. The book. But it's not one book. Because within that one book, there are actually 66 books. 66 writings. Of course, 66 is the number that doesn't include the Apocrypha, and depending on which version or translation of the Bible, it can kind of vary a little bit, but 66 is pretty much the standard number. And in actuality, 
Party by the Lafitte Library. A collection of many things. A collection of many things that have been written by many authors, revised by many authors, written over two to three thousand years. Now, we agree that it is scripture, which means that it is the inspired work and inspired writings of God. But those inspired words were translated and transitioned to us from humans, a human endeavor inspired by God. And so we tend not to understand that there is one style one type of book, many different types of books in the Bible. You know, we, we pretty much know that there are two testaments, Hebrew scripture, or what we call the Old Testament, and the New Testament. There are 39 books in Hebrew scripture, and they span 2,000 years of Israel's history. There are 27 books in the New Testament, and they were for the most part written in the first hundred years from Jesus' birth, and they were written in Greek. And within this holy works, this holy library, there are five or more distinct genres of writing. There's the historical narrative, scriptures that gives a, a history of real events, a timeline of, of uh, Israel and its people. And those historical narratives take up a good bit more than 40% of the scripture. Then there's the law, the biblical law. And if you read Deuteronomy or Numbers or Exodus, you will find a lot of that. And those are the ones where you find God's commands. Then, of course, there's poetry, the symbolic language, particularly of the Psalms. And then, of course, there's the poetry of the Song of Solomon and Lamentation, and there are hymns in there and songs. There's the wisdom literature, Proverbs of wisdom. Those are the collected wisdoms of God's people over generations. Books of the prophets, prophetic literature, of which there's a subgenre of apocalyptic literature, Book of Revelation. And apocalyptic literature is that which describes and points to the end times, the second coming. And, and apocalyptic literature, even outside of the book of Revelation, is sprinkled throughout all the books. Then, of course, we have the epistles. They are the letters, all in distinct style. And uh, there are 21 epistles that are written by six authors. And then, of course, there are the Gospels. The Gospels are a narrative retelling, an eyewitness testimony of the life of Jesus, but they're not just a history. They are this epiphany, this revelation of not only what Jesus did and said, but who he is. Why he came? What is the point of the Messiah? And within the Gospels, you will find many of the other types of genres. And then, of course, there's the literary forms. There's prose, there's narratives, there's prayers, there's parables, there's fables, prophecies, genealogies, allegories, metaphors, sagas, and debates. And what happens sometimes when we get lost in the demons and the kangaroos, we're not paying attention to the genre and the form. Because back in those days, it was an oral history. People told stories. And those stories were meant to take us to a different place, a different understanding of our relationship with God and what God wants. And they used all of these forms to make a point, to tell a story, to engage us. And sometimes we get so lost in those little things of style and, and uh, 
pieces of the story that we lose where the story was going. I recall the story of a man who spent his lifetime trying to find remnants of Noah's Ark. And he was doing this to reassure himself that the Bible was truly inspired by God and inerrant. Because if he could find pieces of Noah's Ark, if he could prove that Noah's Ark existed, then he had put his faith correctly in Scripture. And in doing so, he misses the point of Noah's Ark, of the Noah Saga. Because it's not history, and it's not meant to be taken literally. It's meant to make a point. And whether he ever found those remnants of Noah's Ark, the story and the message would still be the same. And the same for us, whether he found it or he didn't. The story stays the same. Now, I get a lot of questions about, you know, how do we look, we preachers look at the scripture? And, and to be honest, it's sometimes not easy because we have to not just take what is there. We have to look at what is happening there. Is it a typical type of drama? And what did they do 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago? How did they use it then? That literary and historical criticism is important to understanding what the message is that was then and is for us now. Because those messages span time. We may not always have those perfect understandings of, of the things that are being used the cast of characters, I like to call them. But we have to work at it to hear the message, to look past that form and that genre, go deeper, to hear what God is saying to us. In the Anglican and Episcopal tradition, we like to say, we take the Bible seriously, but not literally. And in doing so, we have to do more work with it. We have to let God enter into our hearts and minds and say, what is God calling us to? Where is God calling us? How is God calling us? What is the method that God is calling us with? And I believe that those stories have lasted this long and, and have fascinated us for this long because of the depth of the underneath part. That story that God is trying to get across to us. And Epiphany is the perfect season for this manifestation. You know, <clears throat> these lessons from Mark are about revealing the nature of Jesus Christ. Revealing to the people there and, and to us who he is, and where his authority comes from, about how he can do those healings and curings and exorcisms. And for the evangelist, he uses those to explain the power that Jesus has. Because in today's lesson, Jesus is revealing his power and authority. The, the Greek word is meant to say spiritual power. A power that comes from God through faith. And the evangelist uses all of those healings to say this is who Jesus is. And, you know, <clears throat> throughout our gospel lessons and, and even in the prophets, there are these amazing cast of characters that have been created for us. Demons and unclean spirits and the woman at the well. The disciples. Jesus' family. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. The scribes. They're all part of the cast of supporting characters that the evangelists and all the writers of scripture use to bring us into the story. 
people that we can understand. Although, let's face it, the demon thing kind of stretches our imagination. And then, of course, there's Peter's mother-in-law and all of the people around there. There's the place, Samaria, and Judah, and Jerusalem. They create this environment, like all the great stories, all the great stories. Uh, I had to watch uh, some new Harry Potter stuff this week, something about the adventures of Grindelwald. I don't even remember what it was, but my grandson insisted I watch it. And I realized that there's always a cast of characters. But underneath that cast of characters, there's this story that we learn. There's a message that we get. The best stories, the ones that last the longest, are the ones that create the best cast of characters because they're the ones that stick with us. You know, our, our lives and our souls are enlivened and enlightened and empowered by those stories. They bring about a relationship with God that is, you know, we're, we're following that through the ages. We're not just learning about God and connecting with God and building a relationship with God now. We are building on what came before us. And we are preparing to build for the future. That's what epiphany means. Manifestation, the revealing of God. Something that's been going on since the Bible's first words. In the beginning. In Hebrew, Bereshit. In Greek, Genesis. From the beginning, the Bible has been our library of hope and faith and our relationship to God. Through all of those genres and styles and types and methods, the scripture of the Bible is ours. It's our resource, our peek into the nature and our relationship with God and where God wants it to go. From now across time, from the beginning, until the day Christ returns at the end time, the Bible is our library, our witness to God's love for us, told sometimes in very strange ways through demons that speak and possibly kangaroos that travel by FedEx across the ocean to Noah's Ark. Amen. Come again in glory to judge the living and the 
unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our presiding Bishop Michael, our diocesan Bishop Kenneth, and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the city of Oxford, for every city and community, and for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who travel on land, on water, or in the air, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widows and orphans, and for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those who are suffering illness and loss during the coronavirus pandemic, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For deliverance, deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the absolution and remission of our sins and offenses, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope, without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Defend us, deliver us, and in thy, and in thy compassion protect us, O Lord, by thy grace. Lord, Lord, Lord have mercy. In the communion of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and our life to Christ our Lord. To thee, O Lord, our God. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you. My own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Thank you, Sarah. 
now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hard to believe, but it is the first Sunday in February, and it is the Sunday that we do the blessings for birthdays and anniversaries. And so, for those whose birthdays are in the month of February, O oh Lord, we give you thanks for the lives and ministries of those who celebrate their birthdays this month. We thank you for the year that they've had. We ask you to give them a wonderful year moving forward. Give them life and fun and laughter and companionship and strength and resilience. And we ask that your blessings be upon them get to see them also again and celebrate with them once again. We ask this in your name, and your blessings in your name. Amen. And for anniversaries that we celebrate this month, I bet there's a whole bunch of folks who got married sometime around next week. Lord, we give thanks for the covenant of marriage, for the lives of two people who have come together to live their lives together as you would have wanted in that covenant. We are thankful for the year that they have had, and we ask your blessings for the year to come. Let them live together in peace and harmony, strength and joy, continued discovery of this life and the life that they live together. We ask your blessings upon them in your name. Amen. Happy birthday. And happy anniversary to everyone. And of course, it's the beginning of the month, and uh, we have a couple of things coming up. This Tuesday, we have our vestry meeting. And uh, we do have, uh, let's see, on Wednesday is the last day to submit the diocesan survey. Please check your email from this morning on the diocesan website and click on that link because this is the survey that will help the standing committee determine how to move forward uh, on their search for a bishop and what of those things that they need to do to have a healthy diocese and a healthy search. If you have any questions about that, the diocese has a specific link for that, which we included in your morning email. And don't forget, we do have coffee hour this morning. Uh, and Please join in. It's always an interesting discussion, and if people do come in and go out, they're not committed to anything except perhaps to bring your own coffee and Danish. So do join us. I look forward to seeing you all. Now we do have our Fully of Coming Club, Ash Wednesday, which will be Wednesday, February 17th. And in the world of coronavirus, or Corona Tide, as some of my colleagues call it, uh, we're doing Ash Wednesday a little bit differently this year. From noon to two at the church and through drive through Dave, our deacon, and I will be doing Ashes to Go. And there's a little description of that uh, in the email, and we'll be sending out additional information on Ashes to Go. And then at 7 p.m., we will be doing a live stream service here in the sanctuary for Ash Wednesday. And we will be taking some reservations for people who would like to attend that evening. But it will be live streamed as we did it for uh, lessons and carols and for, uh, uh, excuse me, along, as we did for our Christmas Eve open house. So look for more information on that coming out next week and some of the things that we will be doing for Lent, as well as for Holy Week and Easter. And we're trying to do that safely uh, and with everyone in 
online. So if you have some ideas or if you have some concerns, please feel free to contact me or any of the board. And then also, we do have an annual meeting coming up in March, and our vestry will be working on that, uh, the final details on that on Tuesday. But we do need you all to step up for nominations. There's a lot of work to be done in the coming year, particularly as we enter into a post-COVID world. So if you'd like to be part of that or volunteer for anything, please remember to put in your nominations. They are due for vestry uh, on March 7th. So we thank you. And by the way, there's lots of other little bits of information uh, on your newsletter announcement that's in the back of your Sunday bulletin. So thank you very much. And if you have any news or if you'd like to volunteer, <clears throat> I'm sure that our tech team could use some folks to uh, sample the mics. Uh, John could use a break. And if you want to learn some creative stuff, just let John Harper know. And I'm sure he'd be willing to teach you how to do some editing and everything. And now, a blessing. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you.